And after 26 years of public life, I step back to say, okay, what's the problem? Where is the problem in our country? Why aren't we solving our problems? Why is it that we were able to solve our problems on the local level, but why is it that in business and in politics we just don't seem to be able to resolve issues and move forward? And it's not just politics, it's in business too. We've seen this with the financial meltdown and Wall Street, and when was the last time you saw a CEO step before the cameras and say, I take full responsibility, right? I really made a mistake. I may even resign from the company. I mean, you just don't get that. And in politics, we've gotten this great ideological divide where most answers are in the middle. And I really benefit from my service of having really had a nonpartisan attitude and a way to govern that has been about pragmatism and about really more of a bringing people together and consensus building. And that has made a big difference. And, I, and that's the kind of leadership I think we need more of. So I developed the type of person in the book that I believe is the straightforward leader. And I go through five chapters. Uh, the straightforward leader, the first chapter about developing your inner leadership qualities. The second chapter about becoming a person of substance and how important it is to know something about something. The third chapter about dealing with crisis and tragedy and how you lead through that. The fourth chapter is about change has changed and how change is different in the 21st century than it's been in the past because of the rapid rate of change and how leaders have to really embrace change, not fight it, and be able to lead effectively through change. You can come sit here if you want. You want to be right by my side. You like old times. <laughs> just looking for a plug. You can, you can be here if you want to. And the, okay. and the final chapter. Well, I, I might take you up on that. You can if you like, sure. And the final chapter is how you have to live a centered life and how there should be congruency between your personal and your professional life to be an effective leader. Now, when I started writing about the inner leadership qualities, I thought back, thought about all the leaders I've known over time, and I draw upon some historical re references, people that I've admired in history, and also people of today, and there is one straightforward leader here who I reference in the book, and that's our former police chief, Chief Hogue. I don't mean to embarrass him, but he is. <laughs> Let me tell you about Chief Hogue just for a minute. I need to brag about him. I, I served with two fantastic police chiefs, Chief Hogue and Chief, current Chief Castor. And when I first uh, hired Chief Hogue, we had one of the highest crime rates for a city of our size in the country. And we sat, I still remember the, the day. Now you probably remember it too. You were sweating profusely. <laughs> I'm just joking. And I said, we've got to reduce crime. Right? Remember that conversation? And he promised me that he would. And he said, I don't need any more people because I have plenty of staff. We have plenty of police officers. And I really don't even need any more money. He said, but I just need you to be behind us. I need you to be for us. And that was our agreement. And when I left office eight years later, our crime had dropped 61.5%. And we were one of the safest cities of our, of our size in the country. And that's because of leadership. That's because of Chief Hogue's straightforward leadership. He set the mission and the goals, and he was with the troops, and he made sure that everyone was motivated, and he selected only the very best people in the top part of the management of the police department. And he took the same resources that the city had historically had, and he switched it all around and reorganized and motivated, and the results were there. Yeah, well, speaking sure. of crime, yeah. um, there's a young lady who lives next door who called the tow company first and then called us to tell us she's called a tow company because the alley's completely blocked. Um, I don't know who's parked in the alley, but that's a through street. It's not a parking space. So if you have a car that's in the alley, I would go, go out right now because she has already called the tow company. Yeah. And I can't help you with it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. <laughs> I just saw some sheepish people <laughs> kind of vote back there. And also, we can't do anything about tickets, can we, Chief? <laughs> 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 on, right? <laughs> I have my uh, elementary school PE coach to thank for teaching me an early lesson in life about how to compete without excuses. His na name was Coach Al Barnes, and he was the PE coach 
in the 1960s at River Hills Elementary School in Temple Terrace. Now, PE in the 1960s was very different than today. We had to like get out there and sweat and run around and climb ropes and things that I think have been outlawed a long time ago through class action lawsuits, I'm sure. But PE is just a little bit different today than it was. We really had to hustle. And he was a great PE coach, and he made us work and work and sweat. And at the end of every week, he had three cinder blocks that he would set up on the basketball court. And the, those who ran the fastest got to stand on the cinder blocks. And, and one day I asked him, I said, Coach Barnes, how come there are always boys on the cinder blocks? And he said, because, Miss Iorio, they run faster than the girls. And I said, all right. So I got my stopwatch and practiced and practiced and practiced. And it took me a while. But eventually I was faster than the slowest boy on the cinder blocks. <laughs> <laughs> and I found my spot on one of those three. And I got to know Coach Barnes, and he actually became a lifelong friend, even though we first met when I was just, um, you know, under 10 years old. And uh, he and his wife, Olga, became fast friends, and he passed away a few years ago. But when I would talk to him uh, when I was the mayor, and, and we would reminisce, he remembered that story. And I said, thank you, Coach Barnes, because you taught me an important lesson about competition and competing. You taught me that if I was going to compete, that I really am just competing with myself. And it was up to me to run faster. And you didn't go out and get a fourth cinder block for the fastest girl. And nor did you say, well, gee, maybe there's going to be a self-esteem problem here if she seems bothered, so maybe we'll just rotate everyone off the cinder blocks. And by the time the year ends, every kid will have be on the cinder block with a ribbon. Instead, he said, if you want to be on that cinder block, you have to run faster. And I so appreciated that lesson, which I think has always taught me how to compete. And that is to compete without any excuses. Just to get out there and win. And when I first ran for the county commission in 1985, and was running and I was just 25 years old, they didn't have a special category just for me, did they? They didn't have a category for young people who don't know what they're doing running for office. <laughs> they don't know what they're getting themselves into. And so that helped me. And learning how to compete without excuses was a very important part of those inner leadership qualities. And so in the book I talk about the importance of honesty and humility and having a positive attitude, the importance of being measured and thoughtful, the importance of being kindness and showing respect for everybody. <coughs> Using power carefully is another inner leadership quality I think is so important. When I first became mayor, I couldn't believe how many people would come up to me and I'd describe to them an issue, a problem, and they'd say, and they say, well, Pam, why don't you just call so-and-so and bring them into the mayor's office and tell them the way it's going to be? And I would think, wow, <laughs> does that person really think that that's the way I should wield power as mayor? I call someone up and say, come on down so I can tell you the way it's going to be. And so I think you can really tell a lot about a person as to how they do wield power, how they exercise it. And I think whenever you have power over another person, whether it's in your personal or professional life, you should treat that other person with a great deal of kindness and respect and use it very carefully. And I think in today's politics particularly, we see a lot of abuse of power. We see a lot of ramming things through and winners and losers. But in the long run, that really doesn't bring about the kind of change that I think is effective change. It doesn't really bring about the kind of change that uh, where, where people believe in what you're trying to achieve and therefore it won't be lasting. So I see that a lot on the state and on the national level. My very first moments as mayor, I was uh, sworn in, it was April 1st, 2003. And it was a big to-do in the ballroom, as you can imagine, at the convention center, a lot of excitement. And I just get, had the oath and given my first speech. And then uh, this very somber-looking police captain, John Bennett, called me over to the side. And, uh, of course, you know, I was brand new. I didn't have my own police chief. I didn't have any of my staff. I hadn't built my staff yet. And I did, hadn't come from the city government. I'd come from county government, so I really didn't understand the structure of city government very well. 
So I'd just been sworn in, and Captain Bennett took me over to the side. He said, Mayor, I hate to break you away from all the well-wishers, he said, but we just got a report from the FBI that a car loaded with explosives is headed towards McDill Air Force Base. And um, this was two years after 9-11, you know, just two years. And he said, so this seems very credible, and I think we've got a real problem here. Right, welcome to the job as mayor, right? <laughs> we have a do-over, Fran, right? You begin to wonder. And so, you know, it's an interesting thing, and I share that. First of all, I went back to the, to the well, you know, I thought, I, for a moment I was off to the side thinking about what to do. And I thought, well, the first thing I need is just more information, and we need to wait and see if this is credible. And we shouldn't tell anyone, because if I start saying something, it could cause problems, and I don't even know who I would tell anyway, because I really didn't have any of my own stuff. <coughs> and so I'll just keep this, and he'll tell me if it's credible, and if it is, then we'll take it from there and take one step at a time. So I went back with all the well-wishers, and about 40 minutes later, he pulled me back, and he said it's been cleared, and there is no threat. And I said, great, now I can be mayor, you know, I can relax. But, you know, I hadn't really thought about what my leadership style was. I don't think, even though I had run for mayor and I had previously been supervisor of elections and county commissioner, I don't think I had really stopped to think, what is my leadership style? And sometimes you really don't know what your leadership style is until you're hit with a real crisis or a tragedy. And then it really hits home, doesn't it? That's when you have to say, okay, this is... This is how I approach things. You know, I'm a, I'm a fact-based person. I like to hear all points of view. I like to give myself time to think. I like to be methodical in my decision-making. Um, I like to be calm because I like calmness when I'm making decisions. I don't like erratic behavior. I don't like a lot of emotion around me when we're making important decisions that affect other people's lives. So you begin to learn these things about yourself as you go along. When I first became mayor, I've always been very pro-law enforcement, but what I didn't expect was that the crisis that would affect me the most was the death of the four police officers in the line of duty. And, um, and I, I've often thought about that, and Chief Hoke here is even more meaningful because we lived through it together. Um, one reason that I think it affected me so much was because I felt that I was sending the police forward on a mission. That we had said to our police officers that we wanted you to reduce crime and to be proactive. And so I felt a real responsibility for every one of the police officers and their safety. And they're such good people. And they worked so hard. And they kept reducing our crime every year. I'll never forget that Chief Hogue, when I first became mayor, he came to me and said, you need to have a police officer who accompanies you everywhere. For lack of a better term, bodyguard, but that's not really the right term. And oh, I fussed with him. And I said, I don't want anyone to follow me any, everywhere. I like to be alone in the car. I want to listen to my music. Motown. <laughs> and I like to have a little bit of time by myself, right? And I don't need anyone to protect me. It bothered me, the whole notion that someone had to protect me. And so he assigned Juan Serrano to me. And I, would, I was terrible to Juan in the first couple of weeks. I would sneak out the back door of my <laughs> office and bolt downtown to a meeting. And Juan would be in the front part of the office, and he wouldn't know that I had even left. But somehow he always found me, and so I became convinced that one night when I had been sleeping, they had put a computer chip in me. <laughs> <laughs> because he always knew where I was. It bothered me so much. And I had this Lincoln they gave me, and I didn't want the Lincoln, and I didn't want Juan, and it bothered me. And I'd, he'd get there, and I'd say, well, Juan, I'm going to drive. No, no, Mayor, you're, I'm going to drive. And I'd be real pouty and sit there and first couple of weeks I wouldn't even talk to him, you know? Well, I did talk to him, but I was grumpy when I talked to him. <laughs> but you know, Juan was really quiet and he never opened up to too many people. And I talk a lot, but I don't open up to too many people, even though I talk a lot. A lot of it's not very re revealing. But it somehow, in our three years together in that car, we ended up talking to one another in ways that were revealing. <laughs>